Uh, well, my first question is about uh, people uh, not aging much on TV, and yet the interaction between generation in Ali Mooders in the building provides an opportunity for great fun. How important it was to depict that in the show, particularly with some of the new entry in the second season? Yes, it's one of my favorite elements of our show, <laughs> and it's right at the core of it, right? So. Like you, when we were first thinking of the show, we had a lot of thoughts in mind. Um, but one of the main thoughts was this idea of um, the theme for our storytelling and everything else we would be doing would be classic meets modern. And so having these two incredible classic comedic pairings in, in Steve and Marty um, and how to be unexpected and modern in that third person in the mix. And then the magic that happened of season in season one, which was the thing we weren't sure of, which was how well is that gonna work? And how well are, the, are we gonna be um, invested in this group? And how well will they be comedically and all of that? But boy, right from the get-go, we all realized, oh my goodness, they're terrific together. And she, Selena, found her way in with these two well-oiled comedic actors who have worked together for decades and she found her way in. And I think that was the surprise and delight for both the audience and for all of us making the show that we just wanted to swim with the three of them wherever they would go. And uh, then the other part of it with the humor, that was, it's a, it's a matter for me of being kind of judicious with it and um, not making it entirely about the intergenerational stuff, but when we hit it and recognize it, um, I like to go a lot of ways with it. So to hit things like, oh my God, the texting life of Charles, <laughs> and you don't need to tell me put your name in and all of those things, that has to be a part of our world. And, and the questions about words and certain things that are tough to figure out and, and Oliver's character feeling just completely like younger than he is, although he's not really. Um, and then finding those moments that are funny. And then also the flip side, so that when we can have Mabel uh, be disarmed by the guys who know something that she doesn't know. And so that intergenerational interplay always has to have a good balance. Um, and, and we have to pick the right moments and the right jokes that land in the organic storytelling that we're trying to do. Thanks. Um, the comedic is obviously strong in Only Murders in the Building, but the dramatic element is of great importance too. How do you balance the writing for such a, a successful result? You know, I think that came a little more naturally to me. Um, I think I've always written with a sense of humor. I think uh, humor is the common denominator between all of us among all cultures that if we can make each other smile we have connection um and so i think i always write from that place when i'm writing characters who are looking to connect which hopefully they are most people do um but i think in general um this opportunity you know i knew it was going to be funny because who was going to be in it but i also knew we were writing a true crime mystery And I wanted that mystery to be good. And I wanted it to be a, you know, a twisty mystery. But I wanted, more importantly, to recognize there's a person who died. And every person matters. And have our characters confront that, who the person really was. Who, they are the victim of something terrible. And unwinding that knot to get to the truth is a very noble act, um, but, it's, but it's to be earned and, and to be respected in many ways. So throughout the season and throughout our show, I always like to recognize the humanity in the story, um, both in our characters' internal lives and our, their own stories themselves and their histories that have brought them to this place, and then to um, you know, honor uh, the mystery story at the core and, and the person who died. Um, so I, we hit on those points and, and I've always said too, too, that, you know, one of my favorite times to laugh is when I shouldn't be laughing when it's at a funeral or in church or something like that. 
So I right totally after, agree with that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the best. <laughs> Tears laughing. I can't be laughing right now. I can't stop laughing. But it's that's that's our show. Hopefully lives at times in that space because they're dealing with very delicate, big life or death situations and doing terribly, finding themselves inappropriate in many ways. <laughs> uh, well, you... you introduce a little these arguments. So um, I personally have this belief that to make people uh, laugh, um, particularly when uh, we all come from different uh, backgrounds, uh, it's more difficult there than uh, connecting emotionally, um, which means it, it, it's harder to make people laugh than cry. So what's your, what's your opinion on, on that? And how important is this Uh, related to the show? It's a great question. I um, agree with you. I, I think it is a greater challenge to make people laugh um, in some ways. I think, um, you know, across the world, and uh, certainly in the world we're living in now, we've never needed a laugh more. Um, but I think the well-earned laugh is, is the challenge there because There's easy laughs and, and there's laughs that the ones I hope we're writing for when we're in our best writing heads are the ones that are laughs of recognition and connection. So if, if you know, someone in Italy or someone in Bulgaria uh, can look at something that they do every day or they recognize that their uncle is like Steve in this moment, um, or, or some connective tissue on the human experience, that to me is the best laugh to have earned. Um, even though Only Murders in the Building is about true crime, the investigation process is not exactly the centerpiece in the show, uh, which is more about how people connect. Um, but why do you think people are drawn to crime stories? You know, I think it is, it goes a little bit to what we were talking about. Um, with, with true crime, um, there are heightened experiences that make with my... Look, it's perfectly timed, a siren coming in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> apologies. Uh, apologies Don't you worry, know. no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, I do think that, you know, I find myself drawn into those stories because it poses a question, usually in a true crime story, that either you feel, oh no, that poor girl or that poor man, um, who died or is in a terrible situation, has gone missing or whatever, you immediately, there's empathy that's created. And I think there's never been a time in my history where I've felt the need for more empathy. Um, so people are reaching out despite themselves through their own stories, uh, whether it's podcasts or, or docu-series or murder mysteries that are fictional. Um, and so I think the landscape of why people are drawn to these kinds of stories lended itself pretty well to a need that people feel to connect. And to, um, I think the other part of it is to find some sort of justice. And that's the part I find very moving about our trio. It's a story about lonely people in many ways coming out of their very isolated bubbles in their apartments to connect with each other, first of all, which makes no sense uh, that they would work together, but then to um, do something together because they're compelled by their own interests in it, but also to find justice for someone by, by respecting their death and, and finding the truth and putting the right person um, in, a, in a situation where they have to face the music. Um, so that, that I find noble. Um, so podcasts are the new normal nowadays. So my next question is, uh, if you ever thought about releasing uh, the real podcast with Charles, Oriville and Mabel along with the show? <laughs> we absolutely thought of that and we wanted to do it. And it, it, we, uh, we may still do it. Um, someone is doing a good podcast about the show itself, but I would say um, 
that would be the one that would I would love to hear myself. The question is, we have three very busy, famous people, and they they give us so much of their time to do this wonderful show we get to do. Um, and then it's a whole other can of worms to say, and now let's do the podcast about it too. But I've talked to them about it, and they're intrigued, and they love the idea. So we'll see if it, we can actually make it happen. It's a good idea. Oh, uh, <laughs> I think I have a, a last question. So do they do a lot of improvisation? On set because I mean they are they are genius and I'm so curious to to know how things works between them. Pure geniuses and and you really feel that when you're working with them all of them um, and then the people that come into the show because they want to work with this group um, so they surprisingly though Um, and I think they would say the same thing. I know Marty and Steve both have said this. Uh, they, they stick pretty close to the scripts. Um, and we, you know, I think we benefit as writers from the many, many years of hearing them in our heads and remembering the ways in which they're funny and the ways in which they've told stories for years in movies and stand up and sketch comedy and everything else. So in my head, at least, I hear them. And if they make perfect sense to me in these characters. And so they recognize that they can always make something better. But it's usually in the, in the script stage where she, he says this line or this line. Or Steve will come on set at the beginning of ready to work on a scene. He'll say, just one line I have this thought about. And I'll say, great. And nothing is better than getting the input from those guys. And from Selena as well. She's you know, from season one to season two, they've now learned their roles even more deeply. And so I really rely on them to tell me what's better or what doesn't make sense or where we're off. I love when I hear that from them and it's, it's rare, but it, it, it has been nice. And every now and then, yes, they'll drop a line in or have a moment where it's just purely them and it's gold, nothing sweeter. Okay, thank you a lot. It was really an honor. And let me just oh. say one thing. I'm a podcaster and I'm a criminologist too. And I, I, am, I am in love with your show. I really am in love. Oh. And I'm usually not a comedy person, but I really fell in love with, with your show. <laughs> so thank you. So thank you kindly so much. And coming from your background, that means so much. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> I Thank hope you enjoy the rest of where we're going. <laughs> I will. Thank Anytime. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.